Well, it's about 11.03. I think I'll go ahead and, and get us started. So thanks everyone for joining. Some of you um, may recognize me, but uh, my name is Sharon Senna. I actually work for Jefferson Center, but in this capacity, I am an, an intern with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And it's my pleasure to uh, meet with you today, along with um, Julie Reskin, our director of CCDC, as we call it, to talk to you about long-term services support. Just a couple of little housekeeping things. Uh, we're um, not a, a huge group, but if you need anything, you can certainly raise your hand in uh, Zoom, uh, put notes in chat. I also wanted to introduce to you uh, Mona Vias, who's on the call. She's the project manager for this initiative with CCDC, and she's kind of watching in the background. Um, so if you need anything, um, she's there to support us as well. So feel free to um, raise a hand if you have a question. We do have some uh, uh, seemingly um, appropriate times to break for questions, but if something comes up, feel free to, to raise a hand and ask if needed. But with that, um, we'll move forward. So we're going to be talking about the long-term services support. There's a, some changes coming to the tool and how um, people are accessing support. And Julie's going to cover a lot about the details behind it, but the hope is that this, this will give you an overview of changes that are coming um, that we hope um, will meet an expectation to provide more equity and support um, for people moving forward. This is specifically a group to chat a little bit about long-term services support with regards to folks with uh, mental illness. Um, long-term services support certainly um, provides disability services to many people, but a lot of times it's, it's also to people with an invisible disability, the people we work with that in mental, with mental illness. Um, there's all kinds of places people with mental illness, as you well know, intersect across um, social change. Um, navigating things from employment and stigma, different injustices, um, health care, and things like that. So we're hoping to talk a little bit about to open doors uh, to kind of promote what mental wellness and uh, supportive services. And the next slide. And there's a lot of unique support needs um, that come up when we talk about folks with mental illness they might be different than what you might think of in terms of long-term services support, the traditional medical model things. These may be people who have maybe issues with executive functioning, issues, um, trouble organizing themselves, survival skills, basic needs, um, supporting them through med boxes and everyday judgment things to provide a, a resource to help them to get to some of their appointments and or manage their day might even be related to supporting their ADLs, house cleaning service, services, um, transportation, how to work things in the world, like uh, using a laundry room, using an ATM machine, grocery shopping, managing money, basic things like this. And long-term services support can really support folks with mental illness as well um, with these things. A lot of times um, to this audience, it's probably not an unknown, but to some it's it's, it's a, a new thing to think about um, supporting folks with uh, the invisible disabilities, like mental illness. Okay. So CCDC is a uh, nonprofit organization. Um, it's a membership of organization really driven by quite a few members as part of the, part of the membership. It's free to anyone that wants to be a part of it. Julie can tell you more about it, but They've been an advocacy group since way long ago, way back in the 70s even, and really helped to, um, with the grassroots effort to grow the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's very, very been, been very enlightening for me as an intern to kind of um, see the impact and the change that's come from efforts um, with this group in partnership with uh, CCDC. There's a lot of great alliances that um, CCDC has across the region. Um, with other disability support um, uh, agencies. And their, their big focus is promoting change at the policy level. So you can, you can bet right now, there's a lot of legislative things going on that, that it's got the interest of this organization they're trying to push or promote or oppose. Um, and there's more information you can learn about the agency a little bit later. 
And then we're gonna to transition to kind of some overview on Medicaid. And this is where I'll pass to Julie. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the basics because I think you all know Medicaid. I think you probably know more than you want to about Medicaid. Um, uh, the first uh, director of, um, ever, I, I, everyone's familiar with HICPUF, right? The Health Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. When HICPUF formed as an agency, the very first director used to say, if you're smart, you can learn Medicaid in three years, but if you're really smart, it takes seven um, because it is so um, complicated. So, uh, but uh, just a couple little things. Um, Medicaid is for low income individuals as well as working adults with disabilities. This is a rel relatively new, um, you know, since 2014 or 15 um, thing that people with disabilities can work and buy into Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is the only funder of what we call long-term services and supports. And that's mostly in Colorado home and community-based services, although we do provide institutional care which I think the goal for everyone, the state and advocates and, and service providers is all that we serve people in the community more than in facilities as much as possible. Um, and, um, but one thing that people, we, we just say this because people seem to not be understanding this, that you can have Medicaid buy-in for both regular Medicaid and home and community-based services. There's, it's not just for regular Medicaid, it's for all of it. Um, and the Medicaid buy-in is really the only path out of poverty for people with these kinds of needs. So, um, so as, as, as I think you all know, there's kind of, we always talk about the two sides of Medicaid. There's the, what we call state plan or regular Medicaid, which is the regular healthcare, you know, like going to the doctor, getting an X-ray, you know, you break your leg, you need a cast, et cetera. It also includes, as you very well know, mental health, um, as well as substance use treatment, um, a limited dental benefit and transportation to medical appointments. We're not gonna talk about that side of Medicaid today. We're gonna talk about the other side, which is the long-term side. Um, and the home and community-based services are the, all of the things that are non-medical, like adult day, personal care, respite, transportation that isn't to doctors, um, and those are all provided through what we call waiver programs. Are you all familiar with waivers? Should I skip over that or? Uh, can you please go over them? Okay, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, so waiver programs are um, the Medicaid, the way it was designed um, many years ago was that the norm for long-term care in those days was nursing facility. A lot has changed over the years, but in this actually, this movement started in Colorado. Um, so initially getting services um, outside of a nursing facility was seen to be something new and different and like kind of a, a, a pilot program almost. So a waiver is a deal between the federal government and the state that says, we're gonna let you go outside of the normal way of doing things and, and give you additional flexibilities. In exchange, you have to kind of do extra things. And in this case with waivers, it's we're gonna provide additional services to targeted groups of individuals. And we're going to um, let people have a little tiny bit more money. Um, the eligibility income is a little bit higher. And, but we're also gonna limit it. We're gonna say there's a certain number of people that we can serve. Unlike Medicaid, waivers can have caps. Like you can say, this is the, the, the top amount we're gonna give someone, whereas in regular Medicaid, you can't do that. Like you couldn't say, um, we're gonna cap hospitalization at 10 days a year or something. I mean, like you can't do that in regular Medicaid. In waivers, you can. We only do it in the developmental disability system now, but the state does have the authority to do that. And every waiver program is capped in terms of numbers we accept. We just don't have, uh, we just set the numbers so high that we don't meet those in most of our waivers. So the, the serve, so when you look at what is a long-term service and support, it's basically anything, it, it's all ages, um, but it's basically anything you need to get through your day. Um, and that, so that for some people that might mean a reminder for some, it might mean uh, transportation. For some, it might mean personal care to help you 
like physically get dressed for someone else. It might mean um, having someone that you can call and problem solve to say, well, I, I mean, and it could be something like I, I didn't do my, I mean, here's it, like I didn't do any laundry and now it's suddenly cold out and all of my warm clothes are dirty. What do I do? And, and help someone problem solve that for the day. Because for some of our clients, that kind of, of issue would throw them into a tailspin and an anxiety attack. And then that just escalates. And next thing you know, it might not be right then, but two days later, they're in the emergency room because they're, it, things have gone out of control. Um, it can be homemaking. A lot of folks with certain types of mental illness, and I'm not sure if this is a result of the mental illness or some of the meds, but can't really see what is like what's messy. So like they need someone to help them keep their home clean, um, respite, day programs, all of those things. So and I always say anything you need to get through your day that you need all the time, whereas medical care is something where you have a problem and you're doing a thing to fix the problem. So again, like you, you get a cast on your leg, physical therapy, you know, like you break your leg and um and now you have to get physical therapy to get your range of motion back in that leg, to get you back to a baseline generally is what medical care is about. And obviously there's certain medical care that people do for long-term conditions that you might do forever, like certain medications is a good example or, um, you know, for, of, of something like that. So one thing that's important is, you know, we call these home and community-based services. Um, and I'll talk a, a little, get into the waiver piece a little bit more um, in a minute, but we talk about these as home and community-based services. Home is wherever you are at this minute. It does not, you do not have to be housed to get these services and you can get them anywhere you go. So I, I use these services personally. If I travel, I can use these services wherever I'm traveling. Um, people who need help like with eating can, you know, they, wherever they're going to eat is where they'll get the services. So it might be at a restaurant. It might be at a friend's house. It might be at their home. It might be at their job. Um, you can use these anywhere um, as long as, you know, again, as long as you're using the actual service, it doesn't matter where. And, um, and people have to be assessed annually. Um, and we'll talk, spend a lot of time talking about the assessment. So I said that waivers are for targeted populations. And the um, and so we have waivers for children and waivers for adults. And I'll just go over these really quickly because the one we care about in this particular training is the community mental health waiver. But it is important to know that if someone is eligible for more than one, they have a choice. Right now, that choice is kind of in name only because you have to know what you're eligible for and ask for it one of the changes that we hope to see is that everyone will just be assessed by someone who knows all of the waivers and then people will be told, I see that you're eligible for these two, here's, a, here's the benefits for each, which works better for your needs. So for children, we have one for kids with life limiting illnesses and that's again, not hospice where you have to, you know, a six month certification, but it could be you have Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and you're expected to only live to be in your 14 and you're expected to live to be 24, that would count because that's life limiting. Um, children's extensive support is for kids usually with severe, very, very severe autism or behavioral issues where literally the person cannot be left alone um, even overnight, that they need to have like that kind of constant, not just eyes, but intervention and supervision. The CHIRP, Children's Habilitative Residential Program, is for kids that need an out-of-home placement. Um, and they, they now have CHIRP where you can get that same level of support in the home, but it's still kind of considered, it's all like almost like therapeutic foster care, but in the same home. And then Children's Home and Community-Based Services is for kids with serious medical issues. The adult waivers are a lot less medical. Um, we have a brain injury waiver for someone who sustained a brain injury and that's either traumatic or non-traumatic. We have two for developmental disabilities. The one that's called DD is for, um, is for people, for, it's called comprehensive. So it's 24 hour care. And that's either in the family home, what's called a host home or a group home. Uh, supported living is 
theoretically for people who need less than 24 hour care, but the reality is it's mostly people that do need 24 hour care, but they're on a wait list for the other waiver because the DD waiver is the only one that actually has a wait list. Um, SCI is spinal cord injury and um, EBD is elderly, blind or disabled. And the disabled can be any kind of disability. It's just as defined by social security. Um, elderly is over 65 and blind is blind as defined by the Social Security Administration. And then most important for today is the Community Mental Health Services waiver. And that waiver, it, it's weird because the services I think are almost identical to the elderly, blind and disabled, um, which is weird because some of the services like aren't totally relevant to people who just have a mental illness. Um, is their only disability, but that, that's the way it is. Um, the only difference is they have more frequent case management visits and case management is from the single entry point that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, so when you apply, so when you're in a waiver, you, again, you meet long-term eligible, long, you're, you're getting long-term care and then you have to fit into one of these groups um, and be um, financially eligible um, as well as functionally eligible. And the functional eligibility, that's the change that is, we're not changing actually what the eligibility standard is, although I think it's gonna make it a little bit broader than what it is now, um, but it is, we are gonna change how we do it. And that's what we're here to talk about um, because there's a change in the tool that gets used to decide, do you qualify? Do you meet what they call the functional level of care? Um, and so that's why we're doing these presentations is we're trying to build kind of an army of advocates to help folks get through this new tool um, and also to let us know if when it gets rolled out, things aren't working so that we can work to correct it really, really quickly before, as, as you all know, working in the system, often what happens is there's a problem, but it doesn't really bubble up quickly. And so by the time it's identified as a problem, it's really baked into people's minds and work habits. And then it's really hard to get it changed. Whereas if something's being rolled out and we can immediately know something's wrong, it's usually something that's wrong on the training end. We can at least get it fixed quickly and before a pattern has developed. So the, why, why is this happening? Um, the first, I want to say why it isn't happening. It's not happening to cut services or benefits. It's supposed to improve outcomes and increase equity. And so um, the, the per, it, there's a lot of inequity in our current system. You have to kind of know a lot. Um, and you could, the same person could do an assessment in County A and County B and get totally different results. That's what we're trying to solve. Um, and also to make sure that the assessment moves into an actual care plan. So it's not totally divorced like it is now where you have an assessment and then you have a care plan, but there isn't really a connection um, between the two. Now that doesn't mean that every assessed need is gonna get met, but that, that doesn't, I mean, that just isn't always gonna happen, but it's good to know what all of the needs are and have it kind of in one place I think it makes case management more functional. And the goal also is to increase flexibility to make sure that there are the right services at the right time and the right amount, and also I should say the right place. But what's important to know is what's right is decided by the client. Um, so it's not, if someone says, well, I think you need to be in a nursing home, that, well, if the client doesn't agree, then that isn't the right place. Um, it, it might even be someone says, I think you need a homemaker and the client says, I don't want a homemaker, then that's not the right service. Um, now, there might be consequences to that, but it's always up to the client. And, and of course, if someone like does not have legal capacity, that's why there is guardianship, um, which again, should be used very sparingly. But, you know, it's, it's really about that flexibility and having people running their own lives. So any questions before I start talking about this assessment? Because it's a small group. So feel, if you have a question, you can feel free to just unmute and ask it. So there's, a, there's gonna be a new, the assessment that we use now is called the ULTC 100.2. And that stands for Uniform Long-Term Care Assessment. And the point two is because it's the second one. Um, no one's come up with a name for this new one yet, but 
I hope it's not going to be called the ULTC 100.3, but it very well might be. I don't know. Um, so again, there's a new assessment because the one, the one that we had was developed about 15 years ago. And unfortunately, HICPUF, it was actually designed to also be move into a care plan, but they stopped training on it like halfway in. So, so, so a lot of people never really got trained on how it was supposed to work. And there's a lot of areas for ambiguity, but a big problem with the current tool is that it doesn't assess for executive function. So it is, so it like, there's a question on behavior and a question on supervision, but the behavior is like, are you a danger to self or others? There's a big difference between being a danger to self and others, which is usually not a permanent state. It's usually, you know, fluctuating and um, not and not needing any help to get through your day. So there are a lot of people that have executive function issues where they need help organizing their day. They might not need someone to physically help them take a shower, but they need, again, that problem solving kind of help. This tool is going to account for that, which I think is super important because I think that not only shows who needs help, but how much help they might need. Um, so, um, so we'll we'll kind of cover, you know, what, what what's what's what is this assessing? So the first thing that scares people is it's called a nursing home level of care. So most people think they hear the word nursing home and they uh uh not me don't want it go away. And for unfortunately and and it's or even hospital level of care. Unfortunately, this is just the language in the law because these waivers come from, as I talked about, not like an alternative to nursing homes. And so what the federal government said is to the state, well, you'll get all this extra flexibility, but you've got to show that, it, that it's cost effective. So they, and, and that's an aggregate number. So if you take all of the people on HCBS and you say, okay, if they all went into a nursing facility today, what would the state pay? Now, obviously not everyone would go into a nursing facility, but that's not, they look at it as if we were paying that, how would that play out? So, um, so anyway, that's, you have to kind of first calm people down about that and say, no one's gonna make you go into a nursing facility. Um, it, it will not happen. There is, it just, it cannot happen. Um, you would have to choose that. It's just the language used to decide if someone's eligible to receive these extra services. And the, the, and the whole point of it is actually not to go to a nursing home, it's to get services in the community. And it helps determine what services will be helpful and how many of the services you get. And this is where people downplaying their disability is really, really damaging. So if someone says, I don't need this and I don't need that, and they really do, it's gonna be a problem. And that's where people who have pre-established relationships with clients can really, really help by, um, by talking to the client and explaining what the purpose is and why it's so important to be really honest about what your needs are and also to reassure them. And again, I think particularly in the mental health community, people are afraid, well, if I, if I look bad, they're going to lock me up, is to really assure them that that can't happen, that you know, you'd have to go to court, like you can't just lock someone up, you have to go to court. Um, there's a bill being heard today, actually, that's going to increase legal representation in those situations. So, um, but you cannot, by, by acknowledging your needs is not going to put you, get you locked up. Um, so the, so then they're like, so who does this? Well, it's a case management agency, but it's a specific one um, right now. And we're going to talk about how this is changing too within the next couple of years, it would be the single entry point. And in Jefferson County, that would be um, Jefferson County options for long-term care. Um, and so they, they would send someone to complete the assessment. Um, they generally are done in the home. I think most of them are not quite back to doing that. They're doing them verbally um, or, or on the phone or remotely right now, but generally they do it in the home and it, it, their questions and presence can be very uncomfortable for people. And so it's also important to prepare people for that and find out what the client needs to feel safe um, and to be able to do it. For some people that's having another person around, um, for some people it might be breaking it up. It's gonna be a longer assessment. So for some people it might be, 
I need to do this in two different meetings. I can't do this whole thing at one sitting. Um, but help your client think through what is it that you need for this to be accessible to you. Um, so the client can decide who they want involved and also if they need any accommodations to get through it. So that might be a note taker. If they're deaf, it would be a sign language interpreter. If they're more comfortable in a different language, it might be a language interpreter. Um, again, whatever it is. And again, a lot of our clients, particularly with mental illness, aren't used to thinking, well, I need this accommodation. So sometimes they need some help. You know, like how do you best communicate? Do you want do you want a friend or family member there to, to help you remember things, um, et cetera? Because again, people always want to put their best foot forward. And sometimes in doing that, they kind of inadvertently hurt themselves. So they, they will have an app, like a tablet or something, and this new assessment tool, and they will be recording answers. Um, and again, super, super personal. Um, so they're going to ask about, you know, bathing, dressing, you know, toileting, all of that stuff. And again, if someone like doesn't have any issues in that area, they can just say, I don't want to answer these. But then they, but then if they don't, it won't get counted towards like, they should make sure that they really don't have any needs because it'll get count. It won't, then it won't get counted towards like how much, how much services they get. But they will ask about, you know, memory, cognition, and behaviors that affect your daily life, which again, it's going to be hard to talk about for a stranger. So for example, if you have someone who has bipolar that's hard to control, you know, for them to say, yeah, I have I have issues with my spending, or you know, I have issues with when I get manic with promiscuity or whatever, it's it's going to be very uncomfortable. But it's really important that they be prepped to talk about everything that they need so that they get the right amount of support. Um, and again, some people might need help with, with personal care. Also, a lot of times people who have taken some of those psych meds for a long time, they develop like Parkinsonian syndrome. I think that's what it's called. Um, or they're, you know, their handshake or they have visual problems. I know I have a family member who's been on Abilify for years and it really changed his eyesight. So you have those, you know, so people do have those physical needs as well. Um, someone who has obesity as a result of the psych meds might need help with exercise, for example. They might need someone to go with them if they're going to go walking or do something like that. Um, they'll also be asked about goals and what's important. And they can choose to have a goal or not. They don't have to have a goal to be in this program. Um, and they'll also ask about routines and if things need to be a certain way. So there might be someone that says, you know, I, I, if I'm going to stay on my meds, I have to have them set up every week and I have to be able to take them at these hours um, or whatever, whatever someone's routine is. And again, some people aren't going to have routines and some will. Um, and they'll also ask about natural supports. And I think this is less of an issue in the mental health world because unfortunately most folks don't have family, but um, we, I always want to warn people about this natural support term because that's code for free family caregiving. And that can be really hard on families and might you we want to discourage that because that's a really good way to push families away. They get to the point where they get so burnt out and tired of it that then the person really is alone. So if you're hearing that someone's family is doing a lot of caregiving, it's important that they know that they could be paid for that, which helps with the resentment and also helps with them having to do run to work and then run home and do all this other stuff. Um, they could be paid for it or someone else can be paid for it and they could not do it. Um, I, and I think particularly in mental health cases that becomes really contentious um, way, when people are having to, do this kind of care um, for people. And sometimes, especially if like money is involved or money management or even stuff like grocery shopping and it's a family member, you get into a lot of the judgment stuff. But again, as, as family members, we have every right to be judgmental. As a personal caregiver, you have absolutely no right to be judgmental. So as a mom, I can say to my, my adult child who lives with a mental illness, you know, you're eating in a really unhealthy way, you know, do you really need to buy those potato chips? And, you know, he can say, get lost mom, but if I'm acting, which I don't, is, is his personal care provider and I'm assisting him to shop, it would be really inappropriate for me to comment on his food choices. Um, so, 
people will also be given the opportunity to tell their personal story. And again, this is optional. They can, they can either add it into a portal before the, the assessment or they can tell it to the person at the assessment. The one thing I'd encourage people about this is that, if, again, some people are going to want to tell their story. And I've told the state, you know, it might be for hours they're going to want to tell their story. Um, but, and, and that, that might be good for some people. For some people, there might be stuff they want someone to know about them before someone comes in their home. So it might be, I am a chain smoker. Um, don't, I don't want to hear it. Um, you know, if you come into my house, like you need to be okay with cigarette smoke. Um, that might be something that someone wants someone to know. It might be, um, you know, I have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they're going to be there with me. It might be, I have, you know, I mean, I always tell people personally that I have large and exuberant dogs, um, who are enthusiastically like to greet people. Um, and they're often have muddy paws. So whatever it is that's, that you want someone to know, but you don't have to do anything here. So once you qualify and you meet the level of care, and generally you're gonna meet the level of care if you need a human assistance to get through your day, um, then, um, then the next thing is you, they develop what they call a support plan, which I think we're used to calling a service plan. And that's, the, that's what services you get, how much and how they're delivered. And the case manager is supposed to, check. and there's depending on a lot of things will depend on kind of how much they set up versus giving you a refer, giving a client a referral and having them set it up. But, um, and then there's a mandatory check-in every quarter. Um, for the mental health waiver, you can't, forego that for some of the other waivers, they'll let you move that to every six months. Um, in the PowerPoint, which Sharon will send you after or Mona will, um, there's um, a glossary with every single, because I just went over some of the long-term services, every single service that's available in every single waiver, not all services are available in all waivers, and um, kind of a waiver chart and um, the eligibility for each in more detail. Um, case managers should also give clients their rights and responsibilities. Um, and again, the client can choose who else they want involved. Um, I'm not going to go over these. I think these are all things that people know, but just, you know, what your rights are, you know, again, any willing and qualified provider, changing providers, you know, those kinds of things. You also have a right to know in advance if your services are going to be stopped and you have a right to continue services during an appeal. The one time where it's really hard to continue services is when you're not being denied. No one's saying, like, let's say someone is, in, this is a common one, they're in an assisted living facility and no one's saying you're not eligible for this or you're not going to get this the assisted living facility saying, we can't safely meet your needs because let's say there's been a number of outbursts or something. Um, that, that That's a little challenging because if they say we can't safely meet your needs, the state generally won't force them to keep the person. And if you can't, if no one can find another place that might de facto result in losing services, but it's not an actual denial. So sometimes those, those sometimes that maintaining services, particularly in a mental health situation, can be a little challenging. Um, we do not have providers of last resort in, in the waiver program. So if someone runs through all the providers available, they are out of luck. Um, people also have a right to file either a grievance or an appeal. And I would say an appeal is about what you get, and a grievance is about how they act. So a grievance might be. You feel like the case manager was rude or didn't return your call. Um, you called your case manager about a quality problem and they said, oh, just suck it up and deal with it or whatever, or just you can't get a timely response. An appeal is, a, and that's generally an informal process, you know, where, you know, you might write a letter of complaint. They write a letter back saying, basically, you know, thanks for sharing. Sorry to hear that. And that's usually it. Um, they're important though, because I think, a decent case management agency, and more importantly, the state looks at these to see if there are bigger problems. 
how do they respond? Because th with a big program, you're never going to do everything perfectly for everyone. So I always see a lack of grievances as more of a problem. And because that's because clients are afraid to speak up. Whereas a place that has some grievance, again, not excessive numbers, but has grievances is good because they're telling people about their rights and they're creating an environment where clients feel safe to speak up. Um, an appeal is a formal process with an administrative law judge, and that's usually when any service or benefit is denied, reduced, terminated, or a request isn't acted upon in a certain time frame. So if you apply for long-term care services and um, you know, financial eligibility is actually 90 days, which is hugely problematic. Um, the single entry point, I think it's like two weeks, but let's say, you know, three months go by, you can file an appeal if, if, you ha if someone hasn't responded in the appropriate timeframes. And when we see systemic problems with this, we often use the appeals as a way to address these. Um, if, if, you, if someone asks for something, if someone says, I would like six hours a day of personal care, um, and the state or their agent, you know, the single entry point says you're eligible for three, the client can appeal that and an administrative law judge will decide what they actually do get. So um, clients also have responsibilities that they'll go over, which is what, and the biggest thing is to let the case manager know if you're not receiving services you're supposed to get, you're supposed to get. We see this a lot where someone, let's say they're set up with homemaking. The homemaker comes a few times, then maybe the homemaker will call the client and say, hey, do you mind if I don't come today? My kid's sick. And then the next week it's, um, oh, my car broke down. And it might be like, if you, if you can, you know, Venmo me some gas money, I can be there. And the client might say, well, I don't have any money. So they don't come. And next thing you know, it's been two months and they haven't come. But the client doesn't tell anyone because they don't want to, quote, get someone in trouble. Or they're afraid that because they said it was okay that first time, or maybe they did Venmo them money and now there's a dispute between the two of them. They're usually, often it's out of fear but they don't let anyone know that they haven't received the services they're supposed to get. Um, and so generally, you know, obviously if you're moving, that might change who your case management agency is. If you're moving within the county, it won't, but they still need to know. And then if someone's in a, you know, the rules say you should notify them anytime you go to an emergency room, uh, hospital, or nursing facility and obviously a nursing facility, yeah. Um, if someone goes to the emergency room, you know, if someone cuts themselves, you know, like opening, you know, or opening a can and slices themselves and needs to go get stitches, I don't think they need to notify a case manager about that kind of thing. But if it's something that impacts their care, then absolutely. So someone, maybe they have a, a break, they need to go in the hospital for a week to get their meds straightened out they come back and maybe they're a little shaky and need more support. Those are the kinds of things you wanna let the case managers know about. Any, I know I've just like spewed a lot of information really quickly. Any questions before I keep going? Um, as far as like people who would be applicable for this kind of assessment, is there any like diagnoses that wouldn't be um, appropriate for this kind of assessment? Or is it like anyone who just feels like they have uh, problems dealing with daily living that wants to have additional services? So they, um, I think for the mental health waiver, they might have, specific, there, there might be some diagnostic codes. Uh, like, I mean, I, I think it's fairly broad, um, but if they don't have that diagnostic code, it, they could go under the elderly, blind and disabled where the criteria is disability by social security or, um, um, or being older or blind. So I don't know if you're, if you're thinking about something in particular, like, um, I mean, obviously I, the big five, but also I think, you know, a personality disorder. Right. Or if they have like, um, like multiple diagnoses, like substance use and uh, personality disorder, like, I don't know if it's yeah. still. Yeah, that would work. I mean, I think the challenge with those with those situations is more keeping providers than eligibility. Okay. Um, but they should be eligible if, again, it's all based on the function. It's really not, even though there's a form you have to do to get on these programs where your doctor has to say what your diagnoses are, it almost doesn't matter um, 
what they are. I think for the mental health waiver, if it can be one of the, you know, when I say the big five, like somewhere in the schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, PTSD um, realm, it, mm -hmm. it's easier because it's, you know, those are seen as, as quote unquote neurobiological. Um, and also I think a personality disorder label really hurts people like once people see it, you know, like once the HCBS providers see it. So um, I think people then go in with an attitude, unfortunately. So now what I don't know and I can find out is um, if it's substance abuse alone, I don't know that that would qualify, but again, it's functional. So that might qualify them just on the regular waiver. Okay. But I will find out about that. Um, Mona, make a note please to remind me to do that. Um, excellent question. Um, Julie, I did have one more quick question. Um, oh, sure. Just, just, just quickly burgeoning as you were chatting, on, especially on that last slide. You mentioned that the assessment is about every quarter. Um, and then we know just about the follow up is every quarter. Oh, the follow up is any the quarter? full assessment is every year. Okay. So the follow up. And then the mid year, quarter. they kind of do a check in assessment, but it's not supposed to be as detailed as the, and is the annual. Was that was the question like the qu what, is it annual or quarterly? The, uh, that was part of the question, but then um, tag on to that is what if somebody finds that they um, have more needs than they answered on their first assessment? Is there any modifications? That absolutely, can occur? that's a great question. So absolutely, um, you can ask for a reassessment anytime based on either I I underestimated my needs or they changed. Right. And a change could be based on like their condition. It could also be like a change of circumstance. So let's say someone, I know in your program, Sharon, you've talked about like you help people get jobs. So right. it might be that someone, when they were sitting at home, they had the energy to do, you know, to kind of manage doing their laundry. And now that they're working, that's become this huge stress thing and they can't manage it anymore. Um, maybe the only place they could get to is no longer, you know, was open only during the day and they're working during the day or whatever. Um, so like you could say, like something's changed. I now I'm now working and, and I want to keep working, but it's super stressful. And now I'm having a hard time managing these other things. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. And then Mike, I had a question, Julie, um, sure. are the quarterly check-ins like face to face or are they, are they no. telephone? video um well okay so before the pandemic they were i think um the the six month was face to face um the i'm not sh i think at one point for mental health waiver they were all face to face but that i don't think that's been the case even before covid so it's just i mean i know i know and so sometimes i'll just send you an email saying i'm checking in if i don't hear from you i'm going to assume everything's fine Oh, really? Okay. Um, but I, I don't know if the mental health waiver, if they allow it to be that lax, but, okay. um, but I know, again, I know since COVID, no, it's all been on the, and it hasn't even been video phone. It's been phone, phone. Okay. So, and it's a, it's a mixed bag because I think for some clients, the check-ins really help. And for others, it's one more thing to have anxiety over and to be intrusive. Yeah. And, it, and there isn't like a, a rhyme or, you know, so I think it's a tough one. You know, we've seen clients where not having me in person, I think has been super damaging and others where it's been a great relief. And Danny, you mentioned that um, definitely there was some phone calls that folks had during uh, prior to COVID occasionally, even prior. Yeah. 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 So, um, since you're not working with the developmental disability system, um, I'm not gonna go over the whole, the, the tool they use now, which is called the SIS and how this gets away from that. It's a horrible tool, but this will get rid of that. But I won't talk about that because I don't know that that's relevant. And so again, the current assessment only determines the, the level of care. And this one will be the level of care and eventually allocate services based on the results. And it'll also on every single assessment, there'll be a way to ask about both self-direction of how do you want to, how many of your services do you want to direct? 
Um, and, you know, and to what level? And, and we only have two services or three services right now that you can direct. Hopefully that'll increase over time. Um, and the, they're also going to be asking about employment to make sure that everyone knows about the buy-in and that, you know, for so many years, people were told, well, if you, if you work, then that means you don't really need long-term services because if you're that disabled, then you, you obviously couldn't work. And finally, we've come into the 21st century and there's an understanding systemically that that's not true, that people can have very significant disabilities and still work and that work is good for people. And so, um, everyone's gonna be asked about employment and we're gonna be watching to make sure that the ask is in a supportive way, not in a like work requirement, you know, kind of that, not in that way, but in a supportive way. Um, in, in the current system, what you get depends on where you live and, in, and there's no, algorithm or tool for anyone outside of the DD system. So again, you can have one assessment that shows, you know, you can have one person get assessed by one case manager that says you need eight hours a day of care. Someone that you can go to a different case manager and they might say you need four. There's no rhyme or reason for who gets what other than really case manager experience. Eventually, and by 2024, everyone will have to use an algorithm, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we are trying to make sure it's fair across regions and also trying to put in place as many safeguards as possible to make sure that the algorithm implementation is not a disaster. Um, so, and again, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so again, it's important to, you know, and, and the state, you saw the state's logo on the beginning of that headset of the, the slideshow. And, um, um, and they know that we're saying this and we're saying this very openly and publicly and they are agreeing with this is that the goal is not to reduce services, but to make sure that there's kind of a full picture of needs and skills and to get the right services in the right amount at the right time. So, we're gonna talk about case, switch gears for a minute, talk about case management, then I'll get back to the algorithm. So at the same time, this big change is going on. They're also redesigning our whole case management system. So right now, um, depending on your disability will depend um, on, um, will depend on um, where you get services. And I'm only gonna talk about the single entry point. Um, agency and that is um so so they're gonna it's gonna change there's gonna be uh, instead of a sep or a ccb there's gonna be a cma which is a case management agency um that will um create one case management agency per region um jefferson county is they're already kind of working this out of who's going to do what um and that'll be all disabilities no matter what what waiver they're seeking. And that's why you're gonna be able to go in, apply, and um, you're gonna be able to go in and apply for services and be told you're eligible for these waivers. So a lot of your clients would probably be eligible for um, mental health. Some of them might also fit in brain injury. Some of them might also fit in physical, dis in, in the elderly, blind, and disabled waiver. The purposes for this, one is better accountability and management. So for example, um, the better accountability and management, it, right now they have, I think there's 20 of one and 24 of the other. So there's like 44 contracts they're managing. It's gonna go into about 20. So they'll have be able to manage things better. And then we have like, here's what they do in the CCB world and here's what they do in the SEP world. And the expectations are not really strong. Like the, some of them are strong on processes, but not really on outcomes. And they're also trying to design a training that where everyone will have to be able to show certain competencies. It's also to get, in, to get a, away from conflicted case management, which we don't really have anywhere except the DD system. But that's kind of when the, the case manager is also the one that is doing um, providing services um, to someone. Um, so the, the same agency, which obviously is a conflict of interest. Um, 
so any questions before I jump into the algorithm? Yeah, kind of. Okay, back sure. Paper. Um, so for instance, if a client is having issues with like laundry or shopping um, and they wanted to use, you know, there's a lot of like the new apps and uh, you can do like Amazon Fresh to go grocery shopping and have that delivered. Is the waiver applicable for those kinds of things or do you have to use their specific companies? Um, that's an awesome question. Um, and we are actually working really hard on that. We're running a bill right now to, to allow Uber and Lyft for transportation for these waivers. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't have that level yet, but that's exactly where I think those of us who are advocates in the disability community wanna go. So, but we don't exactly have to use their agencies. Um, you can get personal care and homemaker through a consumer directed model where the client can hire who they want. Uh -huh. So you couldn't use Amazon Fresh right now, but you could hire who you want to, to make meals. To have like go grocery shopping for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. about for transportation for that? Again, right now it's pretty much cab companies. Um, oh, are you saying like, like how to get to the grocery store? Yeah. Like if you didn't want to use IntelliRide for. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you absolutely don't want to use IntelliRide if you don't have yeah. to. Um, so, um, so IntelliRide doesn't even do this kind of transportation. Okay, um, so you, yeah, this yeah. is non-medical. Right, it's non-medical. And so there are non-medical providers, but I know that um, most people who don't need a wheelchair are just using cabs. Okay. Um, to, and, and again, we're hoping if this bill passes, and, you know, a, a law passes and then they've got to implement it and blah, blah, blah. So I'm hoping in a year or so we'll have Uber and Lyft. That would be so cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, because I think that moves us more towards, again, the client directed. And eventually I'd love it to be, you need help with meals. And this is a great segue into how an algorithm can be helpful. The cost to help you with meals should be X, you know, let's just say, you know, $200 a month, here's $200 a month, and you can use, you can hire someone to go to the grocery store for you and cook, you can do Amazon Fresh or one of those meal kits. Um, if you want to, you know, spend $100 one month on a nutritionist to help you plan a meal, you can do that because it's a whole year's worth, you know, and if you don't want to do that, that's okay too. Um, so that's, that's exactly where we want to go. It's just not there exactly yet. So, um, so great questions. So what is an algorithm? And again, just because the state says it's person-centered in front of it doesn't mean it's going to be a good thing. It also doesn't mean it's going to be a bad thing. We don't know yet. And it's kind of up to all of us to make sure it's not a bad thing. It, an algorithm in general is a step-by-step -step process where, that's programmed into a computer. So all of these things, all of these questions that people answer, like I, I have a hard time remembering things. I sometimes need help with, um, you know, with dressing, whatever, you know, I need help with laundry and housework and transportation. I need help with whatever. All of that gets fed into a, a, a computer thingy and People who are smarter than I, um, luckily we have a member of our group who's an engineer who's gonna be involved in this, create some formula and that pops out a dollar, probably not an exact dollar amount, but a range. So you're, you know, so like we have, we have members who use ventilators. They're, what they need a month is way, 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 way higher than what most of us need. But for an average person, let's just say, okay, you need about $2,000 of help a month. And that might include transportation, personal care, and homemaking. Um, so it'll say, this is your range. Then you develop a support plan out of that. Um, so what, how, what, what's good or bad about that? Well, obviously, if all the dollar amounts are too low, that's bad. Um, if, the, if the algorithm doesn't take into account all of your needs, that's bad. That's one of the problems with the developmental disability one we have now is, it, is the state tried to make the algorithm fit their budget. And so they like just decided, well, we're not gonna take half of these questions into account. And 
Um, but, but most important is that there be an exception process because no matter how careful, and I don't think anyone involved in this now has any ill will or isn't trying to do things right. Um, but, um, you know, but, you know, they're people and you can't think of every single possible situation. So given that you can't think of every possible situation, you're going to have someone that goes through it. The case manager does everything right. The client answers everything right. And the number doesn't work for whatever reason, for some situation that none of us have thought of yet. That's why we need an exception process. Because you might have that $2,000 number and that client really needs 2,500. Or maybe they need 3,000. And maybe there's a really good reason. So there needs to be a really clear trans, um, exception process. And then if, if, every, if, if the state starts seeing a ton of exceptions, with, they'll notice a pattern. So gee, we're noticing that, you know, we've processed, you know, 500, you know, exceptions and 75% of these have major mental illnesses. Well, that means there's something that we're not taking into account. And then because the algorithm is something we're developing as a state rather than buying it off the shelf, we then go adjust the numbers to say, okay, if you have a diagnosis of, let's say schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, um, that we need to adjust something here or we need to ask the questions differently or whatever, but you'll be, they'll be able to track that kind of stuff. So, and these algorithms can be, and, and again, that also solves the equity issue of how come one person is getting, you know, a higher level than another when they're the exact same need. Um, and, and again, we've seen some pretty clear equity issues that um, go across expected lines, particularly people who have language justice needs um, people of color, particularly people um, who are Native American, um, are not getting equitable access. Um, so the, this can help. Um, it can also show someone really what their true support needs are, because right now it's like, well, what service do you want? People don't even know what to ask for, and they're generally afraid to, you know, it might be that someone needs more services. Um, or someone can say, well, I don't think I need that much and they don't have to take it, that's fine. In other states, what's caused the problem is um, uh, managed care when um, long-term care is part of managed care. And um, we don't have that in Colorado. We actually have a state law that says we can't do managed care for long-term care. Uh, lack of transparency where no one knows, which was what we have in the DD system. It's really hard to figure out what's under the hood, so to speak, in that tool. Now, some people like me who aren't mathematicians aren't going to necessarily understand what's under the hood, but we will have access to that. So people um, who do know how to look at that stuff will be able to look at it and everyone will know what, how, how this is decided. And in other states, there's no exception process. So, um, and we, we will have an exception process. So any questions before I... Okay, so we're gonna wrap up by kind of saying how, how you stay involved um, because this is, we only think that these changes only work well if people are involved at all levels. Um, and so we really want to invite, you know, people who use these services as well as people that might be assisting those who use these services to get involved. Um, and the ways to do that are you can, first of all, when, when these new case management agencies come out, there's, they're all going to have to have a community advisory board. So you can join that. Um, the person-centered budget algorithm group will need to, and it's going to be really important to have folks who know mental health in that. That won't start for probably a year um, because they're going to start the assessments of soft launch in July, full launch in October, and they've got to collect some data before they can really start working on the budget algorithm. But there will be a group and we really need people like you who get it about mental health to be part of that. Um, and then also to just be an advocate for people who are going through the system, like to go, you know, to sit with them during the assessment, to help them prepare for the assessment. Um, we are gonna be designing the training. We're gonna be getting trained on the assessment tool and we're gonna then be designing the training on that. And so we will have, that will be available. That's kind of part two of this series. 
we'll make that available once we have it, which will probably be the very end of the calendar year. Um, and then there's a ton of different stakeholder involvement with um, Medicaid, with HICPUF. And so John Barry, um, and again, that PowerPoint will have his name um, and email. He has a constant contact distribution list and you get, I mean, you could do nothing but go to HICPUF stakeholder meetings all day, every day, if you wanted to. And I'm sure that's what everyone wants to do here. But there, you know, again, particularly on the case management redesign, there's been almost no input from mental health. Um, it's been very focused on developmental disability. And I think it's really important that someone be advocating for mental health um, because the needs are different and the clientele is different. Um, and again, there's a steering committee that's working on this tool. So there's a bunch of different ways to be involved and we could really use your input. Um, Mona will be sending you a survey asking about further participation and to give feedback on this. Um, and even if you don't want to be involved, if you're not sure, you can always sign up and you can always change your mind later. If someone says stop sending emails, we actually will. Um, and so at the end of the presentation, which I don't go over, there's, but at the PowerPoint, there'll be a lot of um, FAQs that clients have. So I'm going to stop the share. So do people have any other questions? Yeah. Um, as far as like, if we have a client that we want to refer, I know the assessment's still being developed, but what would we, who would we refer them to right now before these? Uh, For the these services? Um, yeah. Are you you're in Jefferson County or are your clients there? Yeah, I'm the mountain team care manager for Jefferson oh. Center, so. Okay, oh, so when you say mountain, if it's Gilpin or Clear Creek, uh, the answer is gonna be different, but anywhere else in Jeffco, uh -huh. yeah, and I know those aren't technically Jeffco. I, it's all confused. Anyway, for yeah. most in Jeffco, it's Jefferson uh, Jefferson County Options for Long Term Care. Okay. Um, and Jefferson's weird because it's like kind of a quasi county. Uh -huh. it's, they're like kind of a county and kind of a uh, a not like a yeah. nonprofit. Unincorporated. Yeah. Yeah, but it's um, I think Karen Stewart is the director, and I think it's K A R I N. And um, Sharon, I'm gonna task you with getting them a contact and sending it. Sure. But that's where you would do it. That's where you would send them now. Okay. Do and you then know? The, el the financial eligibility is just through the county. Eventually that financial and functional is gonna get streamlined also, but that's further out. Do you know if Gilpin and Clear Creek have them or? Or should I do some digging for those? Open and Clear Creek are under adult care management. Okay. Um, and that's just a different single entry point. Okay. Great. Great questions and um, discussion. I've appreciated learning again. <laughs> um, any other talking points and other was questions about waivers anything that wasn't covered you have a burning question about great well I appreciate everybody attending and Mona I think has a I think you've converted to a zoom survey right yes oh okay <laughs> there it yeah, is you could take a quick second to respond that'd be great Yeah, and we'll, so um, once we conclude here, we'll follow up. Uh, like I mentioned, um, I, I know many of you because of my role um, at Jefferson Center, but it, at CCDC, I'm, um, I'm, the, I'm an intern, a social work intern, um, learning lots alongside Julie and others. Um, Mona's the project manager, by way of reminder, for this initiative at CCDC. So you might see um, emails with her name on it too as some follow-up along with, um, with uh, my support as well. Feel free to reach out. You know how to find me So, too. I'm happy to route, but wonderful. Um, Mona, was there any concluding things we wanted to say before? No, as soon as the recording is available, we'll be getting that out to everybody. Yeah. 
And Julie, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, it's always great to uh, be in an audience. <laughs> and yeah, it's been, thank been you. fun to kind of gear it towards our, our mental health community. Uh, it definitely has a different um, different service need. So that's been great. Great. In, any final thoughts or questions, anyone? Just thank you. I had no idea that there was even a brain injury waiver. And I was already messaging that to a couple of my team members like, yo, I did no, I no idea. So thank you. Yeah, and the brain even. injury waiver does have some cool services that are really yeah. specific to brain injury. That's so okay. You can yeah. tell your mom's on the website when you get the mm -hmm. And just hearing that change about including the executive functioning, that's Huge. my gosh that's incredible so I yeah. didn't realize that that wasn't a part of the current tool so just knowing how that's going to quickly shift what this tool can actually do for individuals on an individual basis more so yeah. that's incredible yeah. so all thank right. you thank you Julie Thanks. I appreciate your yeah. knowledge and expertise you you said well, all of that all. very well compared to what I could imagine coming out of my mouth so thank you for your your information and, and coming to share with us and thank share for getting us all this information. Yay. Good. Yay. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank that. you. Thanks everyone. Have a Bye. great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone.